this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. We've got Dr. Anna Sahlstrom Drury. She is one of the current PGY2 Emergency Medicine Pharmacy residents at the University of Kentucky Healthcare in Lexington, Kentucky. And today, she will be presenting her journal article titled A Systematic Review of the Effectiveness and Safety of Droperidol for Pediatric Agitation in Acute Care Settings. Thanks for that introduction. Hi, everyone. So before we get started, I wanted to do a little poll everywhere just to see. We talked about practice variations just to assess what you all are doing with droperidol and pediatric agitation. So if you're able to and willing, please look on that poll everywhere and put that on your phone or on your um, screen so we can poll you all. So the first question is, how comfortable do you feel with managing an acutely agitated pediatric patient? Okay, so I see some mixed responses, um, anywhere from comfortable to very uncomfortable, but no one would say I think that they're like very comfortable. With our next question is, does your institution have a standard operating protocol or policy for evaluating an acutely agitated pediatric patient? So it looks like 40% of you all say, yes, you do have one, whereas 60% either do not have one or are unsure. And then the last question is, have you used Droperidol to manage pediatric acute agitation at your institution? Well, it looks like about a tenth of you all have actually used it. So I'm curious to know what doses you will use so we can discuss that after this journal presentation. So here's just a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. I know pediatric patients may pose a challenge and a little bit of uncomfort when we take care of them. So I wanted to do first go into a little bit of background so for our pediatric agitated patients, unfortunately, we are having an increased number of visits for this reason. And when we think about agitation, we have to think about the underlying etiology of agitation. It could be a psychiatric problem. It could be tox related anxiety. It could be comorbid physical diseases or delirium. And what's tricky about our pediatric population specifically is depending on their age, they may not be able to articulate why exactly they're feeling agitated. And depending on their age, it may make it harder to use non-pharmacologic de-escalation strategies in these patients. When we think about the management of agitation in the emergency department setting, we of course want to start with non-pharmacologic strategies. So we can think about environmental reasons and ways to de-escalate, such as reducing the noise and the lights in the room, avoiding excessive interactions, and minimizing the length of stay as much as possible. When we think about de-escalation techniques and calming interventions, these can involve things such as using distraction, giving coping skills of coloring sheets, Play-Doh, things like that for our children, and considering using child life if you have that available at your institution to help with some of these strategies. However, sometimes non-pharmacologic strategies are not enough to be able to appropriately, appropriately manage agitation in our pediatric patients. So then we have to start to think about pharmacologic therapy. And the goals of using this pharmacologic therapy would be to number one, target the underlying suspected cause or etiology of the agitation, and also to calm the patient enough to facilitate appropriate assessment and treatment of their underlying conditions. And of course, to ensure the safety of the patient and also our staff members too. We have a few treatment options when we think about pediatric agitation. For the sake of this presentation, I won't go into every single one of them. However, we can consider the different dosage forms, IV, IM, and oral therapies. And we can see that ideally, if a patient's willing and amenable to taking PO, that's oftentimes preferred. However, there are times when we do have to resort to intramuscular administration or IV administration of medications. And things that we'd have to think about include the onset of action, the duration, and also patient compliance or amenability to taking medications. 
getting into our study drug, droperidol. So this is a first-generation antipsychotic and a dopamine receptor antagonist. It has multiple indications and multiple uses in the emergency department and other areas of care as well, including as an antiemetic for headaches, for psychosis and agitation, among others. You can see the typical doses on this slide, and this is particularly for the adult side of things. And when we think about the pharmacokinetics of droperidol versus haloperidol, droperidol has a faster onset of action and also a shorter duration. So it makes it more of an ideal drug therapy to use when we just need to sedate a child or a pediatric patient for a short period of time to facilitate care and also facilitate them waking up and coming back to themselves. However, one downside of droperidol that's been controversial was in 2001, the U.S. FDA put a black box warning specifically for QT prolongation and torsades. They recommended getting an EKG prior to administration and using continuous cardiac monitoring for two to three hours after droperidol administration. We don't have time to get into all the literature behind this black box warning and why some of this has been debunked, but long story short, in different studies, also the one linked in this um, slideshow, the cases in which this occurred were typically at very high droperidol doses, even up to 600 milligrams intravenously. And so because of that, and because more studies came out showing that droperidol is actually um, has fewer adverse effects than what this black box warning may imply. In 2015, the American Academy of Emergency Medicine came out with a position statement that stated that there's insufficient evidence to actually recommend continuous EKG monitoring after administering droperidol doses of less than or equal to 2.5 milligrams given IM or IV. They mentioned that doses up to 10 milligrams appear to be safe and effective for our agitated patients and also gave the caveat that clinical judgment is needed in this case-by-case -case basis. So this kind of helped establish the basis of using droperidol in our adult patient population again. However, there's not many good articles or studies about our pediatric use of droperidol for acute agitation. So this is where the study attempted to address this need and lack of data. So their goal of this study was to evaluate the efficacy and the safety of droperidol use in pediatric patients for acute agitation. When we go into our methods, this was a systematic review, again, that looked at efficacy and safety of droperidol use. It followed the PRISMA guidelines and they registered their protocol in advance. When they were screening different articles, they included patients that were the age of 21 years of age or younger. And they chose this 21 year cutoff because that was the upper age limit of one of the studies that they included. They looked at droperidol administration specifically for acute agitation. And these studies had to either look at that like by itself or they could compare its use to another medication for the same indication. All the studies had to have been in English and they could have been randomized control trials, systematic reviews or meta-analyses, cohort studies, case control studies, or case series and reports. Because they were looking at efficacy and safety outcomes, they further defined this in the study. So for our efficacy outcomes, they looked first at sedation. So time to sedation, depth of sedation, and duration of sedation. They also looked at the need for subsequent doses of droperidol or another medication. And they also looked at the utility in preventing patient or staff injury. When they looked at the safety outcomes, they selected looking at adverse drug events, cardiac arrhythmias, hypotension, hypoxia with need for airway intervention, as well as extrapyramidal symptoms. They looked at a number of databases in order to find their article selection, and they used four main search themes. So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of all their search criteria and their keywords and whatnot, but basically they looked at, again, pediatric age, an acute care setting, droperidol, and then acute agitation. They included articles that were published before March 31st of 2021, and they had a nice systematic process for reviewing articles for inclusion. Now let's get into the results. So they originally had 937 articles after their original searches. However, 506 of these articles were removed because they were duplicates, leaving 431. After reviewing the titles of these 431 articles, they excluded an additional 327. So they actually read through 104 articles. 
98 of those were removed after they've read through those articles. And so at the end of the game, six articles were actually included. When we look at the nature of the included articles, you can see here that they span a really large range of time, anywhere from 1998 to 2019. And they included patients that were ages 7 to 21 years old. And we'll see later that what the normal age range was in this study. When we look at our study sites, they had two that were pre-hospital, one in the emergency department, and three that were inpatient hospital. And for our designs, one was a prospective observational, half of them were retrospective observational, and two of them were case reports. At the end of the day, this included a total of 198 patients who received 241 medication administration episodes. That's about 1.22 administrations per patient. Now, when we get into the nitty gritty of the droperidol dosing, you'll see some of the heterogeneity of these studies. So on to orient you to this table, on the left is the reference, the last name, and um, then you can see the setting, the sample size, age, and droperidol dose. So looking at the setting again, about half of them were the inpatient setting, one was in the ED, and two were pre-hospital. And when we look at our sample size, you can see here that it's various. So our two case reports only had one patient each, and Schwartz and colleagues and Page and colleagues had about 82% of the whole patients. When we look at our age range, you can also see that it's typically adolescents and teenagers. Joshi et al. had the lowest, so 9.1 years was the mean. Hamir and colleagues had about 12.8 years old. Um, Schwartz and colleagues had an age range of 13 to 21 years of age, and Paige and colleagues had a range of 7 to 15 years of age. So at the end of the day, 7 years old was the youngest, and it went all the way up to 21 years of age. Now the Joperidol dose. When we look at all these studies, they all had a very different strategy for dosing Joperidol. Anywhere from a pretty conservative 1.3 milligrams to 3.1 milligrams, up to 10 milligrams in our one 17 year old and Culver and colleagues, and then a more a wider range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 mix per cake in our page and colleagues trial with a max of 10 milligrams. When we get into more of the details of Joe Peridol, of all of these administrations, they were all in, given intramuscularly except 56 IV administrations, specifically in the study by Schwartz and colleagues. Now, only two of these six studies had a standardized agitation severity scale that they used to determine whether or not a patient qualified for droperidol administration. Hamir and colleagues looked at a level of three or greater on a scale that they used specifically at their institution. So a three for at their institution would be physical or verbal hyperactivity with threats of violence. So if they were doing that or had above, then they would qualify for droperidol. The other study that had a standardized measure was the Page and colleague study that used the validated sedation assessment tool and used a score of positive two to positive three to administer droperidol. And of these six studies, three of them had recommendations for repeat dosing. Um, Joshi et al. had a repeat dose if there is a lack of response after 30 minutes. Hamir and colleagues looked at a repeating doses within 15 to 30 minutes with a max of four doses per day. And Paige and colleagues allowed their patients to have a repeat dose after 15 minutes, just one additional dose of that medication. Now, when we look at our studies, our systematic review studies outcomes, let's first take a look at their efficacy outcomes. We can see here that for time to sedation, it was typically anywhere from three minutes to 15 minutes for most of the patients. Schwartz and colleagues and Culver and colleagues did not report time to sedation, but the other four studies did. When we think about depth and duration of sedation, this also varied. So our Joshi et al. had a duration of about one hour, give or take 30 minutes, and two patients of their 26 required a second dose. When we look at our Hamir and colleagues, so this was six patients who collectively had 20 administrations, four of them were sleeping within an hour, so they deemed that effective. Schwartz and colleagues had effective sedation in 86% of patients, and 22% of their 68 patients required a second dose. And you can see in our page and colleagues, our largest one, only one of 102 patients, about 1% had a failure to sedate, and 18% required subsequent doses. 
But now the safety outcomes, the reason why we got the black box warning in the first place on our adult side. Um, so when we look at our safety outcomes, they're all in all pretty mild reactions. So looking first at our dystonic reactions, Josh et al. had one patient with rigidity and two patients with extra pyramidal symptoms, and Paige et al. had two dystonic reactions. All cases across the board improved after administration of either diphenhydramine or benztropine. When we look at uh, hemodynamic stability in our vital signs. Hamir and colleagues had one patient with hypotension, and Paige and colleagues had five patients with hypotension. In the Hamir trial, it was only one patient, and they also received concomitant lorazepam and haloperidol. And in our Paige and colleague study, four of their five patients were asymptomatic, and they resolved without any intervention. And one patient who had hypotension responded appropriately with IV fluids. And our Ho and colleagues case report that patient uh, maintained normal vital signs. Looking at our QTC, you can see here that while well, only two cases reported anything about QTC, our SWATs and colleagues said that there's no cases of QTC prolongation or arrhythmia on cardiac monitoring, and they used the cardiac monitoring this whole time until discharge to assess their patients. In our Culver and studies and colleague study, it was a QTC that was prolonged at 505 milliseconds, but this was after their patient ingested 2,800 milligrams of lamotrigine, and so that elevated QTC was attributed to the lamotrigine overdose and not the droperidol. When we look at the other outcomes, Hamir and colleagues reported that some patients had drowsiness, nervousness, or restlessness, but they didn't report the number of patients who actually experienced those symptoms, and they were all managed appropriately without many invasive interventions. And in our Page and colleagues, they did have one patient with acute alcohol intoxication that had respiratory depression, and that was a respiratory rate of 8 and an O2 sat of 88% on room air that resolved with just supplemental oxygen nasal cannula. So no intubations, none of that was required here. Now into our discussion and our analysis of the systematic review. So globally, when you pull these, these studies together, 82.3% of patients were adequately sedated after one dose, and the reported onset was about three to five minutes with sedation lightning after one hour. So it seems here that droperidol seems to have and like be efficacious for this population. And when we looked at our safety outcomes, just to recap, it was generally well tolerated. There were some reported adverse effects that were resolved with minimal intervention. However, the big limitations of the study is evaluating the risks of biases. So this review did look at the risks of biases and ultimately concluded that there's too much bias to do an actual meta-analysis on the systematic review. And you can see here, I tried to make it pretty straightforward that all six studies had either moderate to critical levels of bias. And you can see the reasons why um, they had this bias. Long story short, most of these studies were not blinded. There was no direct comparator groups for any of these trials or retrospective chart reviews. And there's no mixed methods. It's all single use droperidol and no other agents too. Additionally, our largest studies, the Page and colleagues, Swats and colleagues, and Josh and colleagues, all had serious risks of bias when looking at our risks here. So the authors discuss some of these limitations here. One of them is the exclusion criteria. So unfortunately, there's a lack of pediatric specific data in many of the studies. Thus their exclusion, they had to exclude most of the articles and could only include six of them. Now we also have to think about the heterogeneity of studies. So when they're looking at efficacy outcomes, and not every trial or study has the same efficacy outcomes, and not every study looked at the same safety outcomes, it's really hard to know what to do with the data. And additionally, as pharmacists, when there's lack of droperidol dosing and redosing strategies, and there's lack of continuity or like homogeneity of the droperidol study, it's hard to know exactly what doses to use and what would be the best for our patients. Additionally, our patient demographics have to be considered. Not all pediatric patients are equal. There's a lot of different age ranges, dose weights, pharmacokinetic principles to consider. And this, this systematic review only included patients ages seven years or older, and most of the patients were more like adolescent and teenager age. 
That being said, the authors did say that, again, the meta-analysis was unable to be performed, but at the end of the day, they concluded that droperidol is a reasonable option for pediatric acute agitation, and they said that further studies were needed to determine an optimal dosing strategy and monitoring parameters for this indication. On my analysis, um, I do agree with what the author said there. I did double check and there's been no new recent publications that I could find that evaluate droperidol use in pediatric patients for acute agitation since March 31st, 2021. However, I do think despite the limitations, this review is very helpful in that it does provide some information on safety and efficacy of droperidol use in peds patients. And we previously did not have a good study that even looked at some of these factors. And additionally, I think that further studies would need to happen in children under the age of seven years old to better assess the safety and the efficacy of droperidol use in that patient population. So at the end of the day, I think droperidol is generally a safe and effective um, medication for acute agitation in our pediatric patients. And I think I'd personally recommend starting with an IM or IV droperidol dose of 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg times one with a max of five milligrams, and then consider trialing an additional dose with a max of 10 milligrams. And this comes from the two largest trials that looked at 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg, and also the one that looked at about 0.14 mg per kg. So to get in the range, I'd say, again, 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg for our dosing. As I said before, we do need more studies to evaluate optimal dosing of droperidol in these patients and monitoring parameters. And I would also recommend a standardized process for assessing whether or not a pediatric patient would qualify for droperidol dosing and also redosing too. With that, I'm happy to take any questions on this study. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.